Next speaker is Rohin Mittal. He'll be speaking on interspectric resection, the fine points of technique. Thank you to the organizers for uh, giving this opportunity to present. Uh, the previous two speakers have shown some beautiful videos about low anterior resection. And what I am going to do in the next 12 minutes is talk about the fine points in an intersphinctic dissection, what extra we need to do when we are doing an ISR and how the differences between an anterior dissection and an ISR are. I am not going to go through the whole technique again. Uh, now this is just a reminder of the levels of ISR, the partial, the subtotal and the total ISR depending on the level of your distal transaction. The biggest point I can uh, actually say is always think twice before doing an ISR. Think about the technical possibility giving a good oncological margin because that's most important but also think of the quality of life of the patient because that again is very important. When you have decided to do an ISR, it's always better to break the operation down into multiple parts, an abdominal component, a pelvic component and a perineal component and then break these down again into sub parts and do them step by step. That way a complex operation becomes easy. Uh, first step would be a high ligation of the IMA. Now this is absolutely essential. You can see here the duodenum is somewhere here. Uh, we are going right up to the origin of the IMA and taking it. This is very important because otherwise our colon will not reach to the pelvic floor and we will not have enough length. So high ligation is an essential part. The next step is that in all uh, ISRs we must do a high ligation of the IMV. So this is another patient, the vessel li I artery ligation is here. We walked up the artery parallel to the vein and the vein is ligated next to the base of the pancreas. Again without this step we will not get enough length to get the colon colon down and we will struggle to do our anastomosis. So the venous ligation has to be, sometimes you might ligate the IMV twice but the proximal ligation has to be at the uh, base of the pancreas. So this is the second most important point which must be done for a intersphinctic resection. Uh, again this whole uh, plane, the mesocolic, uh, submesocolic plane must be uh, dissected. The next important point is a complete splenic flexure mobilization. If we do not do a complete splenic flexure mobilization, we cannot do an ISR. So again, this is a different patient. We have ligated the vein here. We continue the retroperitoneal dissection over the pancreas. You can see the pancreas is bare here. And we keep going till we actually enter the lesser sac. So you, you will see now that I will enter the lesser sac here. You actually, you can see the, yeah, that's the lesser sac being entered. And so the whole dissection is now complete from below. Uh, and this is very important to be able to mobilize the splenic flexure completely. Once we have done this, then we mobilize the colon laterally. Uh, if we have done a good medial to lateral dissection, all we need to do is actually just uh, open the peritoneum and we will meet our medial to lateral dissection. We continue this cranially till the spleen and mobilize the splenic flexure this way. So that's the second part of the splenic flexure mobilization. So here you can see the spleen coming up, uh, the whole colon is being moved uh, medially and uh, we are meeting up with the dissection which we have already done medially. Here you can see that we have met up with the dissection which has done, been done medially. Now the third part of the splenic flexure mobilization is to uh, divide the connection between the omentum and the transverse colon. Again we go there, uh, divide the omentum uh, uh, between the stomach and the colon and again this dissection meets up with our previous dissection. If we do all of these three, then the splenic flexure is completely mobile. So we mobilize from the superiorly, from laterally and from inferiorly and this will make sure that we have adequate reach of the colon till the pelvic floor. Then we go to the pelvic part of the operation. Uh, rectal dissection has to be done down to the pelvic floor in the mesorectal plane. So this bit is very similar to a anterior dissection or a low anterior dissection. Uh, as Dr. Saklani pointed out, uh, posterior first, uh, anterior uh, and then lateral. Uh, I consider it as a cylinder, you do a bit posteriorly, you do a bit laterally, you do a bit anteriorly and you keep going circumferentially rather than trying to work in a small tunnel. Uh, so here we have done the posterior bit, here we are doing the, uh, uh, we have done the lateral bit, we are doing the anterolateral and now we are doing the anterior. You can see that the seminal vesicles are there and we keep going down till we reach pelvic flow circumferentially. Be careful of the ureter, once we go very low you can see the ureter is turning and going into the bladder there and this is the point where ureter can be injured. So again, uh, stay in the mesorectal uh, plane and keep going. You can see pelvic floor which was just there. Uh, and then again a bit anteriorly, a bit laterally and a bit posteriorly and you keep going down. Posterior is easiest so we start with that first and then continue laterally. So you can see 
again you can see the pelvic floor muscle fibers coming in here and you keep going in this plane till you reach pelvic floor circumferentially again bit lateral bit anterior and then we'll bit do a bit on the right till we reach pelvic floor there are two vessels at 10 o'clock and uh, 2 o'clock which tend to bleed so be careful about that again now we're doing the right side and then again anteriorly we are at the level of the prostate now uh, you can see pelvic floor here we are about a few centimeters away from the pelvic floor and you continue in the same plane to go right down to the pelvic floor now once we reach the pelvic floor then we need to do the intersphincteric groove dissection to go into the intersphincteric plane here you can see the mesorectum has ended this is bare rectum this is pelvic floor and we open this fascia here and go into the uh, intersphincteric groove so this is uh, pelvic floor muscle uh, this is the rectal wall muscle and this is the groove that is there which we can develop and go into the intersphincteric groove so again we need to do this circumferentially we're doing this on the right side now you can see the groove being developed over here then we do the same thing on the left side you can see again there are fibers uh, of this endopelvic fascia which come up which we need to divide and then enter into the intersphincteric groove so that's there and then the same thing we do anteriorly so that way we have gone in the intersphincteric groove to do a truly intersphincteric dissection Again, there will be lots of these small, small fibers which need to be divided till we are well into the intersphincteric groove. The next step then uh, would be to divide the hiatal ligament or the anocoxygeal ligament that comes posteriorly and that will come up in a minute. Uh, again, anterior dissection sometimes can be a bit challenging and we must make sure that that is complete. Otherwise, the perineal part of the operation will then become uh, very difficult. So now you can see this. Uh, puberectal sling forming very nicely and we have gone about a centimeter or two into the intersphincteric groove. The last bit of the pelvic component is the anocoxygeal or the hiatal ligament division. Again, this was I think beautifully demonstrated by Dr. Saklani also earlier. Uh, you go lift the rectum up and you will see this ligament. If you do not divide this ligament, we will not you know, uh, get good length and we will struggle in the perineal component. So again, this ligament needs to be divided uh, and once that is divided, our abdominal component of the operation is uh, complete. Uh, visualization can be quite difficult in this. If you are using a 30 degree camera, tilting the camera fully up usually helps in this uh, dissection. Uh, it is quite deep in the pelvis and you need a good uh, camera operator to actually be able to do this operation. Once we have done the abdominal component, we move to the perineal component. Uh, always useful to have Allen stirrups, have good positioning and have a headlight for this operation because we are going to work in a very narrow tiny space and getting light in is very very difficult. So, uh, personally, I prefer a Lone Star retractor. If you don't have a Lone Star retractor, you can use sutures, but this is easy to get and if you are doing ISRs, I think it's a very useful accessory to have. So, use a Lone Star retractor to stretch the anus out. Identify the anatomy next. So, what I am demonstrating now is the dentate line. Uh, so, depending on the level of your intersphincteric resection, you will then mark the margin. Big advantage is that you can look at the tumor and get your distal margin very clear. So, circumferential marking of the margin is done. Uh, this bit of the operation actually is quite difficult to see and record. Uh, so, I apologize for the uh, sort of out of focus pictures at times. Now, once we make this cut, the important point is to make this cut perpendicular to direction of the rectal wall and not go submucosally because our aim is to remove uh, the mucosa, submucosa and the internal sphincter and go into the intersphincteric plane. Again, it is a bloodless plane. If you are in the right plane, it will not bleed. Uh, so you hold the mucosa and the internal sphincter with uh, the, your forceps and try and go in the intersphincteric plane uh, circumferentially. This will only be about 2 or 3 centimeters because we have already done most of the dissection from top. Uh, so uh, this has to be done circumferentially. Um, so this is this being done on the right side. Uh, again, you can use retractors to look at it. So this is the external sphincter, this is the internal sphincter and the mucosa and there is this plane. If you actually look, it has got a bit of that areolar tissue or the sort of angel hair look and it keeps going up and we can keep descending in that plane and after about 2 or 3 centimeters you will enter into the abdominal cavity or the pelvic cavity because of your previous dissection. Then you can pass a finger and then you can actually cut on your finger if required to circumferentially mobilize the specimen. Once the specimen is mobilized, the whole specimen can then be delivered transperineally. You can look and see because we have got good mobilization, length is not a problem. 
uh, the specimen, uh, uh, the mesorectal fascia looks intact. We then choose a point of transaction. We can use ICG if required at this point. In this case, we have not used ICG. Uh, we take a few sutures uh, at the four corners just to maintain orientation and then remove the specimen. And then finally, we perform a hands-on uh, coloanal anastomosis to the cut line and our uh, anastomosis. So this is uh, uh, usually performed interrupted. Uh, I take four sutures at the four corners and then uh, sutures in between. While tying the sutures, I take the Lone Star Retractor off so that the tension is not there and the whole anastomosis will finally go inside and not be visible. So that's the perineal bit of the operation. Now the intersphincteric plane is very difficult to see. So I've got a tiny clip of about 30 seconds of an intersphincteric APR which shows that intersphincteric plane. It's the same plane that we need to get in an uh, intersphincteric resection with anastomosis, but it's just seeing this will help us do the intersphincteric uh, LAR. So here we have gone, just the skin dissect cut is outside, but we are here again going to go into the intersphincteric plane. So the internal sphincter is on this side. This is the external sphincter and you can see here this sort of cobweb-like space that opens up. That is the intersphincteric space and it usually does not bleed and it keeps going inside. Uh, in a, uh, a, a ISR where you want to do an anastomosis, only a skin cut is not on the skin but inside, but it's the same plane that you need to follow and you go and meet up with the abdominal dissector in about 3 or 4 centimeters inside. So this video is just to demonstrate the same plane. Uh, to summarize, choose your patients wisely. A good abdominal dissection right to the intersphincteric groove and the perineal component in a stepwise fashion. Break the operation down into smaller steps and it will be easy. Uh, thank you. And a big thank you to my team and to uh, Dr. Rajivan who helped me with the videos. Thank you. Excellent uh, presentation. Any questions from the audience? Yeah. Hi, thank you. It's a good video. So when you do the, inter, uh, the perineal part, um, I think it's always better to have a suturing after you raise the flap. Yes. Because or there will be tumor cells coming out and there could be a, like TATME, you do a, uh, yes. a perineal uh, a suturing. Yes, of the absolutely, I agree. Uh, if there's enough space, I think a good purse string suture, to, once we make the dissection, a good purse string suture to close the rectum does help. It prevents tumor spillage and it prevents content from spilling out and infection True. as well. And even if there is no um, distress space, even after dissecting a bit, still you can put a yes, suture absolutely. after that also. Yes, absolutely, I agree. Okay. And, uh, just to add to Dr. Vivek from Delhi, just a very beautiful demonstration of an intersphincter resection. I think one more thing that the stay suture also helps you is when you were dissecting that intersphincter resection, you realize that the uh, part which you have incised keeps falling back into the pelvis somehow because you are trying to look at it from outside. The patient is a bit head low at that point in time, you don't want the small ball and everything else coming in. So it keeps falling down. So if you have stay suture, so what we usually do is even before we make that cut, We'll take a small stay suture just below the level of the tumor before making that uh, full thickness incision in the rectal wall so that that wall doesn't go away. So that or another thing that doesn't happen is that when you're trying to pull out the whole thing with the Babcock's forceps, that's the time you may tear the specimen yes. as well. Absolutely. I agree. I think it's an important point. Uh, when possible, we should take a pursuing suture. It helps in, in multiple ways. Mm, I fully agree because we had uh, problems where the specimen actually went inside. Yes. It's difficult to retrieve and you make yes. more spillage. And we are trying to take out a big bulky rectum through a very tiny space. So you yeah. need to, you know, sometimes give a lot of pressure. And if you don't have good traction, the specimen tears. Absolutely. And that's something we don't want. Sure. I can see Dr. Ramakrishna here. Do you want to say something? Mm. Right. Anybody else? Manas? He's not there. Dr. Avnish? Well, wonderful demonstration. Um, thank you. Thank you very much.